But yeah, so welcome everybody today to Collaborate number three. This um, today with Michael Henderson, I'm really looking forward to. It's taken me quite a while to, to pin down Michael, and this is sort of the first step. Um, but we've got, yeah, about 30 odd clients here today from around the country um, and business owners. Um, we've also got two charities um, on the line too, which are close to myself and, and Michael's hearts, which is uh, the St. John's um, Trust, obviously, and the Race for Life Trust, which is pretty cool. So, um, yeah, welcome you guys. Um, but we're very lucky to have Michael here along, along today. Um, I mean, a quick story on how we met. I actually got invited just to an event in, uh, in the city um, about sales training and things. It was on culture, which is something I'm very passionate about. So I thought, bugger it, I'll go along. And didn't have that high expectations, but um, you know, I certainly got pretty um, blown away in that, in that four-hour session with Michael that um, I couldn't let him go. So I introduced myself, and it took me about another six months to kind of strangle him into um, you know, collaborating on our own idea of, of bringing an event to, to our clients. So we managed to actually pull that off after about a year in the, in the making, and then unfortunately COVID hit, and um, we're looking to re rebook that in for later in the year. So if you love what you hear today, then we're obviously going to put, be putting on this event, which is exciting for uh, later in the year. Uh, but no, Michael's got some incredible you know, clients to his name. He's worked with Z Energy, uh, Canon, High Performance New Zealand. Um, I mean, all over the world as well, you know, banks in America and, you know, um, all over the show. So an incredible um, career um, in corporate anthropology. Um, and is it true, Michael, that you are the secret weapon in behind Scott Robertson from the Crusaders? Can I, can I ask that? You can ask it. I just can't answer. Fair enough. Perfect. Um, <laughs> obviously, he's done pretty well in the last few years, so no pressure. Um, but no, so... Uh, welcome, Michael. I want to get straight into it. Um, I would say, obviously, you are, the, in my eyes, the culture king of New Zealand. I think, um, you know, hearing you speak and the, and the amazing success you've had with a lot of businesses, I think um, you, you certainly have a very, very good handle on what culture is about from a very, very deep perspective. So um, strap in, hold on, and um, look forward to the next um, hour. So, Michael, can you just, yeah, give us a quick sort of rundown and, and a background I know I loved your intro that you did at that event that I met you at, but um, can you just give us a quick run on how you got into it and um, yeah, what you're about? Certainly. Well, firstly, good morning, everybody. And, and thank you, Mark, for the invitation to uh, discuss with you today. A uh, couple of things I just want to sort of point out straight away. Uh, although I appreciate Mark's extremely kind words in the introduction, I often do get positioned as a culture expert and the reality is there's kind of no such thing. Um, and the reason for that is you can have a cultural enthusiast, but nobody's an expert on all cultures. Um, so you can, you can be very kind of familiar, maybe even very passionate, maybe even a very staunch supporter of a particular culture. And that can be a company culture. Maybe it's your local football team. Maybe it's an indigenous culture, but even by being a member or a staunch fan and, and contributor into a singular culture automatically means that you've sort of become biased against other cultures or viewing other cultures. So I just want to sort of signal that up straight away. I appreciate the compliment, Mark, in terms of culture expert. Um, I'm just very, very cautious around that word because in our field, we try and avoid that. And it's not a, it's not a humility ploy. It's a kind of factual thing as I describe myself as a cultural enthusiast. I'm extremely enthusiastic about it. Uh, it's not just my work, it's my lifelong hobby. And because of that, I've got kind of a wide range of understanding. But to be an expert, you almost need to have surrendered everything and sort of dropped into uh, one culture and just become sort of locked into that. But in doing so, you immediately lose access to others. Um, so thank you. To answer your question, how did I get into all this? I've got a degree in social anthropology from Auckland University. Um, anthropology, for those of you who aren't familiar, basically is the study of human beings as curators of culture. So that's a kind of a, an academic way of saying anthropology studies human beings through the filter or through the lens or through the process of them making cultures together. So it's different from things like psychology, which tends to look at kind of what's going on in your, your mindsets. And I understand, I think even your last collaborator, if I remember rightly, Mark, was around that kind of um, uh, mental space and health and well-being. Um, so organizational psychology is kind of the, the mind at work, if you like. Anthropology is about the collective at work. So what happens is when we come together as a group and 
maybe in a group situation, you're not quite as extroverted as you would be if you were on your own, or maybe in a group situation is when, when you come kind of to life because you like to interact with others and express yourself and connect with others. So anthropology is the study of um, long-term sort of group behavior in the context of a culture. And before we go any, any further, I know we're going to use that word culture a lot probably during the course of the conversation. So I just want to kind of get in early and say uh, my definition of culture, if that's all right. Um, and again, this is kind of a weird thing, but there's no, even in anthropology, there is no universally accepted definition of culture that we've all agreed on, right? So there's no kind of formula like EMC squared or two plus two. Um, that we all agree on. So even even the concept of culture is still open for debate and discussion. But having oh. said all that, my definition of culture, I'm a bit of a purist. The word culture comes from the Latin word cultus, which we're all actually quite familiar with because it's the root word in uh, English words like horticulture or viticulture or permaculture. So cultus from the Latin means to care. So if you absolutely want to know what organizational and company culture or team culture is about, what you're really, really inquiring into, what you're really, really discussing and paying attention to is what do we care about? Yeah. Yeah. How much do we care about that? And how do we prove that to the world? So a lot of organizations kind of describe culture as either um, in a complimentary way, the way we do things around here, or if they're a little bit more cynical, they might kind of go, it's that soft, fluffy stuff. And both of those kind of pretty good attempts at trying to describe culture, but they don't really get to the root of it all. So I really like whenever I'm working with my clients, especially in the high performance environments, um, we really, really kind of get grounded in what do we care about? And it plays out throughout the organization because that can be you know do you really care about your customers or do you just simply care about making a profit do you really care about health and safety or are you just following process so that you stayed and stay employed right so you're, you're compliant so you can stay employed and can continue to pay the rent and feed the kids so um, I always encourage my clients to have quite a deep and meaningful conversation around what do we really 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 care about and, and let's get that on the table. Let's get very clear about that. And that's not to say that profit's wrong. It's, it's completely valid. It's not to say that uh, customer service is wrong, it's completely valid, but you just want to kind of have a look at the mix of everything you actually care about. Now, the reason for that is what we care about is what motivates us. What motivates us is what drives our behaviors. What drives our behaviors forms our identity. So if you think about who you've become as a team or a company or a brand or an organization, a large chunk of what you've actually come, become, often uh, a mixture of both deliberately and by accident, is actually just emanating out of this underlying caring about something. And during COVID, for example, the, what people have been caring about is survival. So there's a lot of organizations uh, that have really, really struggled during this time. So rightly, their, their concern has been about survival. So it's just about putting that on the table. It's not about being embarrassed about it or ashamed or seeing it as a weakness. It's going, okay, where are we at? What do we care about right now? And just by placing that in the conversation, it means you can then start to act like adults and actually ask questions about it, support each other and, and guide each other. Yeah, awesome. So the awesome. thing I quickly just want to uh, finish off as well is a lot of people get anthropology mixed up with archaeology. So I just want to clear that up straight away. And this is mainly because there may be some questions later in the conversation where I go, uh, actually, you need to talk to a, an archaeologist about that because I wouldn't have a clue. So a couple <laughs> of things you need to be aware of. As I said, anthropologists study culture, which in other words means we study living human beings in culture. So we study alive. Archaeologists, study dead cultures. The archaeologists are the people you see kind of in the Indiana Jones kind of movies where they go digging, digging in the ruins um, and looking for pottery and artifacts to find out what happened to those people way back when. How, how come they're no longer with us anymore? What were, they, what were they caring about that ended up leading to their own demise, to their own collapse? 
So we, we send archaeologists in once the culture's crashed and died, and anthropologists' job is to uh, explore and understand a culture and even advise them at times on what they might need to do to actually stay alive and prosper and ensure their continuity. Awesome. And I mean, because one thing I was so fascinated about when we first met and, and that first um, talk you did was that you actually lived in a couple of villages in, in South Africa, was it? Um, uh, yeah, th throughout Africa and South America. Yeah, awesome. And so when, like living in those, that, that type of environment, what for you like sort of stands out as being, why were those cultures still surviving as opposed to some of those other cultures that, you know, we know, you know, have, have died off and I think you said there's something like 6,000 cultures in the world. However, that is slowly contracting. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not even slowly contracting. When I was born, which was in the very early 1960s, there were 7,500 languages spoken on the planet. And we're, uh, as an, in anthropology, we're really, really interested in language because when a language starts to die, the culture's going with it. Right. So as of now, and kind of I'm in my mid-50s now, um, there's less than half of those languages still spoken on the planet. Wow. So just in my lifetime so far, uh, over half the spoken dialects and languages on the planet have disappeared, which means the cultures have either gone with them or are going to in my lifetime and be gone by the next generation. So to your question, how come some of those cultures in Africa or South, Ar South America survived and by the way, some of them didn't. Uh, so I was with one of them again, just last September, I went back to visit them and they're in real, real trouble. Like they're not going to make it. Oh, wow. But, but there's a number of different factors as you can imagine that impact on that. That can be war, famine, climate, politics, uh, famine, disease, right? Um, I don't know if you've been following the news of what's going on in the Congo at the moment. We're all worried about COVID. They've just got a new outbreak of Ebola and they're already the country with the greatest um, impact of the measles outbreak that we've been hearing about a little bit here. And in, so they've got three, right, going on at the same time. Plus they're a politically unstable nation anyway. Plus there's high degrees of corruption. So even when you send an aid, it doesn't get to who you want to send it to. So there's a whole bunch of factors that come into whether you make it or not. Similar to business, right? Not necessarily yeah. one thing that will put you out of business. It's going to be a number, right? Mm. And that's, I think you, you make a good point. That's that kind of reference, I think, between, you know, how cultures um, are obviously, you know, um, contracting globally, but also how businesses contract globally. And I think there's so much relevance there between actually what do, you know, successful cultures that thrive and survive, you know, I guess in summary to transition, what, what is the key thing that you see um, those cultures, those people, those teams, those businesses that really do punch through a crisis or change or... Um, okay. Without question, the, there's a couple of kind of core factors that we go looking for to, to understand whether you've got a good chance of survival. Number one, and I've done over, just to put this in context for everybody, I've done over 300 organizational cultural transformation programs in my career across all sorts of industries. So I'm not talking about one or two examples I'm drawing on here. I'm talking about a fairly comprehensive research and, and case study background to draw on here. But categorically, one of the number one indicators that you will survive is you genuinely care about human beings. So a pretty good way of ensuring your culture ends up in some pretty serious trouble is when you do not care about fellow human beings. So uh, at, at the risk of being a little controversial, a really example of that, even in Aotearoa in the fairly recent past, some of our law firms, in fact, a lot of our law firms got called out for the racism, sexism and bullying going on within the law practices. And the brand damage that does to both the industry, but also the individual law practice that were called out on that is almost irreparable, right? You just, you just don't get to recover from that. And if you imagine law practices are kind of trying to attract talented lawyers from law school to come and work for them, to build revenue, to build the value of the practice. Um, if you factor in things like the, the, uh, greatest percentage of the high qualified lawyers in New Zealand now are Asian women coming out of our law schools. And the industry in New Zealand has just been sexist and racist 
and bullying straight away, right? Because those, those practices have demonstrated, look, we don't really care about human beings. We just really care about optimizing the value we can extract from the marketplace. Then these talented, intelligent, young professionals, right? Are coming out of things like law school going, well, I'm, there's no way I'm working for you. Right. I'd, I'd rather take my skills elsewhere and, and do some kind of good in the world and be treated fairly and nicely. So categorically, the number one is hand over heart. Do you genuinely care about human beings? Yeah. Go and look at famous things like Enron. Right. Enron won the best place to work award in the whole of the United States the year before it went under. So it was, it was deemed to be kind of the place to work. But inside the culture, again, it was corrupt. There was bullying going on. There was overt uh, corruption in terms of even corrupting personal portfolios or, or brands. So people were undermining each other, backstabbing each other, etc. So it was kind of literally dog in eat dog. So again, it's a really, really good example of you don't care about human beings, you're going down. Um, I won't mention any political systems in the world at the moment, but there's a fairly prominent political leader right, <laughs> that, that clearly only cares about one person, doesn't care about the people. So from an anthropological perspective, if you sit and observe that, you're going, yep, this is going down. Right? There's no anthropological evidence in thousands of years that, they're gonna, that, that, that entity, that party is going to make it and stay in power. Yeah. So like, and the other thing, what I've always been intrigued about is kind of the, um, you know, what can we do as small business owners or small team? You know, we, we all have teams or we have, um, you know, small to medium sized enterprise, some large, larger teams, etc. But what are some of those signs that you can sort of start to look for? And, and I know culture is a thing that is culturing. You talk about it, it's, it's always evolving. And I think that's something we should all remember is that culture is never done. You don't put the vision and the, the things you believe in and what you care about on the wall and, and write them up in an email and say, that's who we are, that's done. It is a constantly evolving um, beast. But what, what is it that can, yeah, how is, as, as um, business leaders and team, team leaders, can we sort of start to identify where there's real room for improvement? So um, a, a key thing, again, said is just monitor. So don't even do anything. Just spend... In the next three or four weeks, just observing yourself and your team and your people in action, just looking for clues that they care about each other or they care about your suppliers or they care about your customers or they care about the investors or um, the shareholders or the stakeholders. So that's a really, really good place to start is just observe how much clear evidence of caring is going on here. If you find it really, really difficult to isolate any, that's a pretty good, pretty good early kind of warning sign that you're, you're kind of on the downward path already. A second thing that will kind of reinforce that is if you've got high staff turnover in an industry that traditionally or currently doesn't have high staff turnover, right, or you have high staff turnover, but your competitors don't. Again, you've got to take a long, hard look in the culture mirror. So look for signs of care. Um, high staff turnover without question is an undeniable indicator that you're potentially not heading in the right direction from a cultural perspective. And then I guess the other one, the, the more obvious one, and this is one that's fairly easy to spot, is the moment you start to see silo mentality when the sales department declares war on your own marketing department or when operations is kind of um, antagonistic towards accounts. So the moment you start to see silo mentality, that, that usually indicates that your overarching culture is actually fractured into either uh, countercultures or subcultures or even conflicting cultures. So those three things, look for care, Look for staff turnover and look for silo mentality or, or the emergence of subcultures that are subcultures are actually okay as long as they're kind of contributing to the whole, but the moment they become antagonistic territorial, particularly if they start to blame other departments, then you've got a culture problem. 
And so when you think like for a lot of us, which obviously we've been through real challenging times um, and we're not always on our best form, either as leaders or as individuals. And I, and I know in my own business, I've not been my best self every single day in this last six weeks. Um, but likewise, I know some of my staff are going through, you know, and, and um, team are going through similar challenges, both at home and pressure at work and everything. But how can you sort of um, identify again, the impact of, you know, um, teams or, or people that perhaps might be impacting that culture and what can we do about it, you know? Like, I mean, and we all probably can think of examples where we individually can um, have that conversation or, or, or take action, but what can we do from a leadership point of view to, to change that outcome or, or drive better behaviours? I think the first thing we could do is just recognise you're dealing with another human being. And I... I get how ridiculously obvious that sounds, but with the greatest respect to all of you and all my clients over the last 35 years, I've found that uh, a lot of organizations have sort of fallen, not even meaning to, they've accidentally fallen into looking at other people in the business as functions before they look at them as human. Right, so they look at them as a, a deliverable process, right? It, this person delivers that. And so I think the best thing you can do is almost just pause and go, okay, this problematic behavior I'm seeing or observing or hearing is the result of a human being struggling in some way. Right. So if just by doing that before you even engage or approach, hopefully it awakens in you a little bit of empathy or at the very least a little bit of curiosity as to, I wonder why that's happening. I wonder what's going on behind the scenes. I wonder what's occurring in their life that I'm not aware of that is showing up as this behavior at work. Yeah. And what about for even for the people I'm thinking about other people now that perhaps report into a senior leadership team or report into a board or, or have other business partners or owners or things like that. What about that sort of upwards management or upwards kind of channeling of, of um, your own feelings and identifying? I mean, same thing. I mean, I think, yeah, yeah. It, it, depends, it depends what culture you've set up. And this is a little bit back to your earlier question about, you know, what should we be looking for? Mm. A really powerful thing to look for is a lot of organizations, again, have inherited a structure that they didn't actually sign up for. It's just inherited. And there's some organizations, even uh, St. John's is a, is a wonderful example where, you know, St. John's is all bordering on an ancient organization with an incredible heritage background and narrative and story and, and so a lot of organizations that have that remarkable history have inherited a framework or a structural setup that is, for example, say hierarchical or political or um, uh, positioned in a particular way. So in order to cope with that in modern times, a lot of the way organizations have been set up, I often say the difference between a modern organization typically is if you think about where you find leadership no, let me, let me back a little bit. If I asked you almost as a group, just in your minds or on a piece of paper, just take a moment and imagine either in your mind or on the piece of paper, imagine a shape that you believe best represents the structure of a modern organization. So if you just picture in your mind or draw on a piece of paper, a shape that if you were going to sort of talk about structures of modern organization, you probably would refer to that shape as a reference point or a symbol of what it looks like and how it's structured. So can I just have some thumbs up on screens or waves if you've understood the question, you understand what I'm actually saying? Can I just get some cool? Yeah, okay, brilliant, lovely, everyone seems to be on board. So how many of you have drawn a triangle? Okay, okay, so again, everyone's kind of going, yep, me, 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 right. Now repeat exactly the same exercise, right? Except this time we're not talking about a modern culture we're talking about an indigenous or what sometimes referred to as a traditional culture so this is back to what mark was referring to when i went spent time in africa and south america if we were to draw a symbol that best represents how that culture is like to be structured again just imagine a shape or draw a shape and how many of you have drawn a circle okay again we've got the vast majority of you going yeah so let me just be clear, that's not me being psychic, right? <laughs> that's, that's what culture is. We know culture is about being flat and level, right? We're all on the same 
um, basis. We're all coming from the same place. We're all coming from being human together. Whereas organizational structure is hierarchical because it's based on the military model. It's, it's copied from the Roman legions, right? And eventually went through to Elizabeth's, Queen Elizabeth's company, the British East India Company, was the first incorporated company on the planet, structured politically. So what happens is when you, when you talk, Mark, about, you know, what about kind of, and you even use the language, what about talking up the chain of command, right? It all depends on the degree to which your organization has already understood and embraced the power of culture as to how easy that is and, and what the process is for doing it. So in really, really high performing environments, and I'm talking anything from high performance sports teams to Olympic teams to the military to, I've worked with Green Lane and cardiac intensive care unit at Green Lane Hospital. So in those environments, they have hierarchy. Believe me, they have hierarchy. They have to because lives depend on it. And at the same time, the culture is a circle. So anybody can point out anything at any time if they think something's at risk or they think we're vulnerable. It's not dependent on your degree or your tenure or your status or your pay packet or your title or your corner office. So it depends the, to answer the question is, you know, how, how do you kind of make that flow? It depends how serious your organization's already taken culture in the first place. Yeah. So if you dismiss it, you're already in trouble. If you've been doing some work on it, you're aware of it, you're paying attention to it, then you've got an opportunity. But just to wrap that up, the things I would kind of leave you all with around that is in anthropology, or, or in our practice at least, we describe language as the bloodline of your culture. And what we mean by that is pose the question to yourself, how safe is it to communicate in your culture? How safe is it for a person that just started yesterday to see something that they went, oh, well, that can't be right, to go up to the CEO or the managing director or their supervisor and go, uh, excuse me, boss, sorry, I know it's my first day on the job, but I just saw water leaking out over there. Or I just saw fuel leaking out over there. Or I just heard a customer uh, complain three times and nobody's paid attention to. Is, is that right? Is that, is that okay? So the, the less comfortable they feel about doing that, the less safe they feel about asking and posing that question, again, more at risk your culture is. So even in even those traditional villages I used to live in, it was completely okay for a young child, right, to come and tell one of the elders that they've just seen an anaconda on the outskirts of the village, right, that somebody should raise the alarm because there's a 40-foot snake, right, right on the edge of our village as opposed to going oh well i'm only a child i don't know much about snakes i don't even know if it was a python or an anaconda i, I better i better keep my mouth shut because who am i to go out and define what the snake is and whether it's even a threat or not really that can't and i guess from a leadership point of view i mean it's patience isn't it because i know i don't have a lot of that to be honest my wife would definitely attest to that but um i think it's you do have to have an enormous sense of patience and really be an incredible listener if you really want to take culture seriously, right? Yeah, and I think, I think patience is just a result of, of humility, mm. right? So if you're impatient, you're kind of lacking some humility. Mm. Mm. It, being <laughs> impatient means you think you've got all the answers, you think you know the right way, you think you know the amount of time it's going to take, you think you have all the resources, right? Which is kind of going, well, do you? That's exactly what my wife would say. I think exactly <laughs> that sort of phrase. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I mean, and I love, I mean, a lot of the stuff that this is what I found fascinating in, in the first instance we met too, because I think so much of it is relative to even the way we talk with family members and, and our kids and, you know, um, you know, people at the shops and just everybody. We're all humans at the end of the day. And I think this, even more so, this last six weeks, eight weeks is really brought that home and um, made, it, made it so relevant that we do need to take stock and just slow down and, and, and listen, you know, two ears, one mouth. There's a lot of, um, you know, great, great analogies out there, but I, yeah, I totally agree. So why do you think, why in your words, again, if we think about, again, those high, high performing teams, high performing cultures, and you talk a lot about it being, you know, a, a culture um, can be up to eight times more influential than your strategy and i think you know a lot of people are talking about that buzzword of god i hate that word but pivot you know at the moment come up with a new strategy pivot strategy all that sort of stuff and you know great don't get me wrong we do need to think about what we look like in the future 
but I think so much so much of it is is about people, right? Um, people make up business. People make teams, high performing teams. So, yeah, I think that's. I don't know. I'm, I'm so on board with that. But how how can you sort of summarize that in a way? Why is culture so, you know, so much more important than literally just coming up with the next big idea or, or strategy? Yeah, it's a really good question, Mark. And in fact, the mere fact most organizations don't know the answer to that question is the only reason I've been employed for 35 years. <laughs> if, uh, and I'm not joking. If, if companies already knew that answer, I and fellow corporate anthropologists, people like Simon Sinek, uh, who many of you listeners probably heard of as well, he's another corporate anthropologist, would be unemployed. Yeah. So on the one hand, I'm more than happy to share. And on the other hand, I'm kind of reluctant because it sort of shortens my career. <laughs> so... The, the research Mark's referring to is the London School of Economics. So I just want to make this very, very clear at the beginning. What I'm about to share came out of economist research, not anthropologist research. The London School of Economics identified in the late 1990s that culture on average is eight times more influential in the results your business is generating than your strategy is. Now, just before I go on, I just want to be very clear. That doesn't mean they're saying you don't need a strategy. You absolutely absolutely, absolutely need a strategy. So I just want to make sure that everyone heard that I said absolutely three times there, because often when I share this information, I get questions, but surely strategy is important. They go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember the three absolutely? Yeah. So clearly saying it's important. So Mark's just asked, well, how is that possible? How can culture be up to eight times more influential? And here's the answer. It's very, very simple. Culture delivers performance. Strategy doesn't. Strategy directs performance. So your strategy, right, basically takes the performance that your employees are providing into the company on a daily basis and says of that performance, we want to go over here. We want to take your performance to achieve this over here. So the, the culture is actually where the performance is provided from. Right? Strategy is literally a direction and a plan of how to win. So you need that, even my organization, and as you, as you can imagine, in my, in my practice, we're culture fanatics. But even we have a, have a strategy that we all go, great, okay, so we've got an amazing culture and it's extremely high performing. What do we want to do with this? What direction do we want it to move in? Who do we want it to serve? Right? Um, how do we compete in the marketplace? Because some of my, my competitors are people like Boston Consultancy Group which is one of the world's largest consultancy group. And we're a tiny little Kiwi company that nobody's heard of. And that's who we have to compete with in the marketplace. So we need a strategy to do that. So culture delivers performance, strategy directs it. And the combination of the two should deliver the outcomes that you're looking for. Sounds easy. Sounds really easy. But we know it's not. We know it's not. Um, <laughs> What, if we were sort of thinking about it for a lot of people going, you know, I, and the common, I think the common thing is a lot of people think, and we've had this conversation lots of times, but um, my culture is awesome. And, and <laughs> or we hear it, especially in recruitment world, um, we've got a fantastic culture. And when you drill into that, it is like paper thin, you know, yeah. um, in terms of how you define it, what it actually is, what, what's different about it, et cetera, et cetera. How can you know people start to sort of really actually have that honest conversation with themselves and the team and, and uh, leaders to actually define okay, what is our culture? Where do we start? Where, where's a starting yeah. point, I guess, for people? I think the, the first thing is you have to understand what the word actually means. So again, even that, we've got a great culture. And remember, from my perspective, culture means care. And I go, oh, really? Okay. Um, do you mind if I just spend a week kind of working in your business? I'll make all the teas and coffees for everybody, but I want to deliver them to their desks or into the warehouse, right? So I want to be able to move around, talk to people and watch. And you can go into the business and see how much care is going on. Mm. Right. So you have to understand what the word means. And that's not, a, that's not a simple thing. Just to put that into perspective, a degree in anthropology is four to five years studying one word. What does culture mean? So it's complex. Yeah. So to understand what care means, then you need to understand how the human brain works. To understand how the human brain works, you need to understand there's not one brain, there's three in there, right? So it goes on and on and on and on. You need to understand that language, as we said earlier, is weaving your culture more than your HR policies are. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very complex. So to answer your question, when people say to me, hey, we've got a really, really good culture, I go, cool, good for you, compared to what? 
good yeah. compared to what you could be good compared to what you used to be good how is it good compared to your competitor is it good compared to your interrupter right and they go what do you mean by that i said well the company that you've never heard of that's about to come into your into your industry and flip it upside down how does your culture compare with them? And you go, well, how could I possibly tell? And you go, exactly, right? But I can tell you as an anthropologist, it's that tribe over the hill you've never heard of that are more sophisticated, more advanced, thinking differently, more organized, more collaborative, right? That can come into your terrain. And, and you've got tens of thousands of years of human history just seeing this over and over and over again. It's not about how good you think you are. It's what's the context you're operating in? How are you comparing yourself? And the really simple way, Mark, is just to ask you a question when you go, we've got a really, really good culture, go, good. How aligned is it to your strategy? Right? You go, what? I'm going, well, you said you've got a great culture. How we all know that culture is eight times more influential than strategy is. How are you determining you've got a good culture in terms of its alignment to strategy? If you cannot answer that question, you're at risk. <laughs> And, and I think, again, there's a lot of people that sit down and a lot of businesses sit down and, and you know, spend an hour in a, in a workshop to define their culture and that's kind of it. And, and it's done yeah. I think, um, something I've really been trying to, trying to work on and, and I can always, you know, I feel like I've not even scratched the surface, but, you, you know, I'm just absorbing the fact that you never, you can never finish um, the, the culture exercise. It just constantly evolves. And, you had a new yeah, to your, your point you made earlier is uh, in our practice, we, we kind of uh, allow the word culture to be used, but we prefer using the word culturing, mm. right? So cult, and the key thing is, that, again, organizations like, listen to the word organization, right? Organized. Organizations like everything in its little box, right? So it's tidy, it's reliable, it's predictable, it's measurable, right? So... The very first meeting I went to when we got out of kind of uh, the, the serious COVID lockdowns, so we was actually allowed to go and meet a customer again and um, went and met the CEO of this organization. And the board had asked me to meet with the individual. And the individual wasn't that particularly happy about me being there, sort of said, well, well the board's asked for you to come and see me. I don't know why they've sent you. We've already done culture. We did it last year. It's over there on the wall. Right. So... Straight away, I went, oh, okay, now I understand why the board really wanted me to come and see you. So in that CEO's mind, culture was the tick the box exercise that had been done last year, right? It was over there captured on the wall with some words or some values or a purpose statement or whatever it is they've done, right? Not understanding it was actually alive and working in their warehouse right now, distributing products, etc. So when you've got a CEO that doesn't understand this is a living, breathing, energizing, performance delivering phenomenon going on in your business, and you've got CEO doesn't understand that. There's boards all around the world that are getting really, really nervous around that. And this is what's going on in Australia at the moment in the financial sector, as you're probably aware, there's that Royal Commission of Inquiry going on. It's because they've suddenly realized senior executives, very, very intelligent people, right? They've got triple, triple degrees in economics and MBAs, et cetera who do not understand what culture is, what culture does, where it comes from, how it forms, and how it's contributing or sabotaging the business on a daily basis. So that's a risk management issue nowadays. And even, I mean, just thinking again into that um, sort of sporting, because I love the sporting analogies when it comes to business, and um, I think it's a fantastic, um, you know, um, correlation. But what happened with the All Blacks? What what happened um, in, your, in, your, in your mind? Because we've got... All the experts we've had, you know, um, a, a culture that we perceive on the outside that is, you know, very inclusive, and, and all of these things, we were the formidable force. So, really, what happened in your eyes last year? Um, and again, I'm kind of going to get quite technical here, so uh, this will probably cause some debate and some degree of well. How do you prove that, right? And it's just years of observing cultures. Um, but, but let me just capture it with this, and it kind of goes to the core of being key in some respect. We use a, uh, in my education program, we have these kind of principles. So there's a, bit, a little bit like, if you imagine we, we're all here to study aerodynamics, how do you make something fly, right? So there's certain principles you need to be familiar with to understand how flying works. So one of them is gravity, right? 
So it's very, very difficult to build or even pilot a, a vehicle effectively to fly if you do not understand what gravity is and how gravity works and how it's impacted. So same applies in culture. If you don't understand what culture is or how it forms, etc., it's difficult to actually even change or create a culture. So because of that, one of the principles we have in our education program is this. What you know is all you know. And it's probably not enough. So my answer to your question when you go back to the All Blacks, that's my answer, is what they knew was all they knew, and it clearly wasn't enough. Yeah. And I say, as that tribe over the hill that just had, a, again, a slightly better culture, a slightly better um, strategy, um, that all came together. It's one of the dangers of being successful, and it's that hubris thing, isn't it? We're all guilty of it, so this is not me pointing the fingers at any of those involved in that campaign last year. Success kind of can breed a sense of having sorted it, finished it, completed it. So, um, again, listen to even the word success as opposed to succeeding. Yeah. Right. So, so what about... Not, well, oh, you go. No, I was going to say, if it, it, it's that sigmoid curve. If you think you're at the top of the curve, right, you've got a choice. You have to either reinvent yourself to go up again or you're probably going to be up against somebody who's already started the upward curve and is three months ahead of you or two years ahead of you or an innovation ahead of you or a, a net promoter score ahead of you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what happens if we sort of, I mean, obviously all these people that are here today, they definitely don't ignore culture. They're here for a reason and that's, that's fantastic. But what happens if you do ignore culture as being a, a fundamental part of success and, and performance? Your your current level of success is limited, so it's not sustainable. Mm. There's, there's no organization I've ever come across in any sector. So I'm talking charitable, religious, political. There's no culture anywhere in the history of humanity being on this planet that has been sustained without there being an awareness and appreciation and an engagement and a um, deliberateness around culturing. Yeah. yeah. Just, just doesn't happen. So if, if you kind of ignore culture, and I don't know, this is kind of an interesting word itself. The word ignore is the root word of ignorance. So when we talk about ignorance, we're actually saying ignorance. So yeah, if you ignore culture, the only, the only way you, you can ignore culture in your organization if it doesn't employ more than three human beings. So if you're a self-employed individual, you don't have to worry about culture. It's just you, the personality. Um, if it's you and your partner, right? So husband and wife team or two boyfriends or whatever it is that have come together to create the, the business, that's not a culture, either. that's a relationship. The moment three people or more turn up that care about a endeavor, culture will form. Awesome. I could sit here all day and listen to this. I just love it. But we see, I mean, day in, day out, we see this as a, from a recruitment perspective, and I, I'd honestly say it's nothing to do with the logo, um, it's nothing to do with the, um, the product necessarily. Um, you know, there's so many components to the businesses that we work with that fundamentally make them successful. But if, if I look at all of the most successful business we work with, hands down, and that's what I'm so passionate about, it, it comes back to the people and the culture that they have. Um, you, can, you can have a yeah, a very successful business um, that is simply made up of just very, very good people. They don't need all the flashy lights or, or, or brand marketing, all that sort of stuff. I mean, that all forms part of it, but it is absolutely the people that make that up and the, the leadership from those people. So I guess, yeah, just, just to wrap up, I guess, um, what to leave us with a few golden nuggets, what should we sort of start doing as we approach this recovery together and this, um, you know, the storm that we're entering I wouldn't even say recovery yet. It's probably the storm that we're entering and it's a really difficult time. What should we start doing as, as leaders, business owners uh, and people? I, th I think the most important thing, and I've been, uh, the last six weeks I've been doing webinar and conference call and consultant call and all I've been doing is having this exact conversation over and over and over again for everyone. And having said that, we in, in my practice have already put in over 70 hours work on exactly what I'm about to share with you. So we're doing the same. So a key thing to understand about human beings, um, especially in a commercial sense is that P 
people do not buy the best product. So what I mean by that is one of the things you should be doing right now is kind of have a look at, look at what it is you sell. And even though I know we've got a couple of charities in the conversation here as well, as far as I'm concerned, selling is nothing more than working with people to influence how they think. That's it. Right. So we can, when we, when we try to get a, uh, an obnoxious teenager to start tidying their bedroom, that's selling, right? If we're trying to get somebody to take better care of themselves and other people, that's selling. So one of the key things I'd be encouraging all of you to do. Uh, thank you. So just, just here's, a, here's an example of care. Do you remember we talked about care earlier? So one of my teams just brought me in a cup of tea because they know my voice conks out after 20 minutes talking. I uh, didn't ask them to do that, but that's somebody doing their job going, oh, anthro boy's doing his thing. He's been talking for over 20 minutes. That means we already know based on how, how much we know about anthro boy is his voice will have gone by now. So they just brought me. So it's those little basic little things that I'm talking about. This is the care element. So, sorry, I just wanted to share that and thank the team member that's done that. So. People don't buy the best product. They buy the easiest and the quickest product to understand. So one of the things I'd be encouraging all of you to be doing is right now as a whole business, this includes everybody in your organization, is asking them what they think you sell. And asking them if they were kind of stopped on a street in a random survey to describe what you sell, ask them to, tr to explain it to you. And you want to gather those and find the easiest and the quickest to understand. Because trading in an unstable economy, if understanding what you do as a business, understanding why it's a benefit to other people and understanding how it's different from anyone else in the marketplace is too hard, or I have to think too much, or it's too confusing, you automatically have already lost business. So one of the things that I just said, we've spent over 70 hours just in our practice alone. And believe me, we're tired. There's only four of us. We've spent 70 hours as a practice working out how do we now describe to a marketplace that's just flipped upside down who we are, what we do, why it's a benefit, and how it's different from anything else in the marketplace. And we, we drill it and drill it and drill it and drill it till, we'll, till we can get to a point where we can say it so that even a seven-year-old kid goes, oh, that's cool. I like that. So just to put that into perspective, my PA has been involved in those conversations, right? Now, does she do selling for a job? No, but she's in constant contact with my clients. They're regularly asking them questions about, you know, can we talk to Michael about this? I needed my PA to be able to, whenever there's an opportunity to explain on behalf of our practice in the simplest possible language, this is what we do. This is why it's of value to, and this is how it's different. This is what we do. This is how it's of value to you. This is how it's different from anything else in the marketplace. Those three things I'd be encouraging every single one of you with every single person in the organization, even if you've got part-time staff or consultants working for you, you want to land on how we all describe and explain that. That's awesome, man. Absolute ruthless simplicity. And I think that's uh, something we can all you know, remember. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to actually get it really simple, but it, it is at the end of the day. Um, that was awesome, Michael. Really, really uh, appreciate that. And I'd definitely love to um, extend an invite to anybody that wants to ask a question. So. Please don't be shy. I know um, Fiona will be keen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, fire, fire them away either in the chat or um, yeah, perhaps just um, take off your video mute and uh, fire away. Um, Simon Taylor here. I, I was just going to ask, thanks Michael for joining and um, presenting. I really enjoyed that. Um, I was just going to ask in terms of culture and workplace. So we're seeing people wanting to move to work from home a little bit. And, um, and I suppose we spent a lot of time and effort building up a culture that revolves around people being present in an office. Um, do you, and it worries me <laughs> a little bit <laughs> as to how we, how we do keep that going. Any, any thoughts from you on that? 
Simon, thank you so much. I was kind of hoping somebody would ask that question because I'm sure that applies to just about everybody that's on this call and just about everybody working in organizations in New Zealand. Even yesterday in the New Zealand Herald, Vodafone announced that um, it's predicting that up to 40% of its people will spend up to 50% of their time working remotely from now on. So it's, it's a, such a good question. The key thing uh, we're kind of encouraging people to do is start to realize that when people isolate, they are going to go back more into their personality than they are into a culture. So they're, because they're working on their own, at their own pace, in their own way, with their own thoughts, they don't necessarily get to banter check, um, counterbalance themselves. So my recommendation is um, almost quadruple the amount of time that leaders are checking in with their people, which I know is a huge ask, but because they're out of sight, what you cannot afford to happen is people to start to feel that because I'm out of sight, I'm out of mind. Mm -hmm. So I'd almost be looking at quadrupling the amount of connection leaders are having or supervisors are having with their teams. And that doesn't need to be time consuming. It can be a text with a smiley face on it saying, hope you have an awesome day today. Let me know if there's anything crops up that you need my help with. Remember, we've got more time on this than we realized. Or what, So it's just simple messages back and forth, just so that people don't feel that they've been forgotten about or isolated. So that would be one point, Simon. Second thing I'd say, Simon, is... Um, when we operate individually, we operate more on our personal values than we do on the organizational values. So I'm just going to say that again for everybody. And this is true for even believe it or not when we're in teams, but it just gets absolutely heightened when we're individual. So a lot of organizations spend time working on their values and they're great. They kind of give us a, a common language and a common sense of expectation from each other. The reality is organizations don't have values, only human beings do. So when those human beings go into isolation, they literally give themselves per mission. So per the mission, right? In reference to the mission they're on, becomes far more driven by their personal values than it does the organizational values. So a really important component, I think, especially if you perceive that the future is gonna require more and more of your people to be in isolation, that they spend time clarifying their personal values and then use those values to look at how they're conducting and behaving themselves in relation to their roles. And I say roles because obviously if they're working from home, that can be parenting, teaching, dog sitting, whatever it happens to be as well. So a vital, vital component to help people navigate themselves or recalibrate themselves is to understand their personal values in the context of a new world and a new way of operating. Awesome. Um, Fiona, did you have one? Do you want to ask? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mark, for facilitating this, uh, this yep. chat with us. And, and Michael, really interesting. Thank you. My question is a simple one. Do you have a vacancy in your company? <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. There was kind of a static click on the lines, so I, I missed each question. Would you mind repeating it? <laughs> sure. Yeah. My question is a simple one. I'm wondering if you have a vacancy in your company. <laughs> Yes, it's inside my head is incredibly vacant. <laughs> uh, look at the question. We, it's, a lot of people, we get asked that question like every week. Uh, in fact, it's almost embarrassing to have clients that work with us saying, can I come and work for you? And, and our kind of answer is, look, if you're enjoying this conversation, if it's been meaningful, if, you, if you're kind of enthralled with it or excited about it, actual best use of the conversations actually in the organizations you're in now or any other organization you go and work with. So uh, thank you for the compliment, but to be perfectly honest, the best use of even the, your enthusiasm for this conversation is in your family. It's with your whanau. It's with, the, it's with the charities that you donate your time and your money to. It's with the uh, PTA meeting or the, the, uh, the, the voluntary work that you do. It's in the organizations you're already in. It's just take it and just lead that conversation, pose those questions, raise the awareness of the importance of culture, raise people's awareness that culture is actually real. It's, it's not a kind of an academic concept. So it's a, kind of, it's a kind of tongue in cheek question, but I guess a, a compliment. I, I support everything you, that you've said today. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I, I, I take and receive the compliment and appreciate it. And I'm just kind of seizing the opportunity to go, yeah, the vacancy is the lack of effective culturing in the marketplace. So let, let's all work together and go fill that vacancy. Awesome. Um, we're just going to ask one more question. So now we're just sort of, uh, we started a little bit late. We'll finish just a tad later, but um, if people are going to go, totally understand. Um, um, what is the best way to define your values was a question we had sent through, Michael. So um, for an organisation, where, you know, where do they start and what is the best way to do that? Get everybody involved. So don't just do it as a leadership exercise. Absolutely don't do it as an external branding company or creative agency doing it for you. Mm. Um, uh, that does my head in. How can they possibly know what you care about? So get everybody involved in your organization and just pose the question, what do we care about? How much do we care about it? And how do we prove that to ourselves and our work? So I'll just repeat those again. What do we care about? How much do we care about that? And how would we prove that to ourselves through our work? Awesome. So that's this general conversation. And then this is just a tip for anybody that's currently working on the values. The most effective organizational values over and over and over again, I've never seen an example that wasn't this, has got them down to only three values. If you've got five values or seven values, you haven't gone deep enough into the conversation yet. Love it. Very simple. But it takes a long time to get there, I take it. <laughs> but it, depend, it depends on how it depends on how easy it is, it is for people to be honest again in your culture, Mark. So mm. if it's completely comfortable and easy for people to sit around the table and put their heart on the table, going, this is what I really, really care about, mm. then that can take seconds. Yeah. But if, but if people are used to having to follow the boss or the bully, or the loud person or the extrovert, right? And, with, and it takes five weeks before the introvert feels safe enough to share their opinion, then yeah, it's gonna be a slow process. So if a really good indication of how good a culture you've got is how quickly you can actually create a set of values. Because if, if you've got a really good culture, people already know and have already seen it demonstrated what you really care about already. How often, just last question on that, how often should we revisit it or should people revisit those? Because again, there's that problem that people go and do this exercise, put them on the wall and email them out and right, done. Um, when every time, every time your context change. So I'm encouraging all the clients I've worked with for the last three decades through COVID, check your values again. Are they still the right ones to be bringing the best out of yourselves? Mm. Awesome. Okay, that's brilliant. Has anyone else got just one final one or should we wrap up? Um, I know we've just gone over a bit. So there's anyone else that wanted to ask? All good? All right, we'll, um, we will wrap up. But um, yeah, thanks again, Michael. Really, really appreciate um, your time today. And, Thank you, everybody. Um, it, was, it was fascinating as always and we look forward to getting this event off the ground um, very soon. Hopefully level one will enable us to uh, get back to normality so yeah now thanks again michael really do we all appreciate your time and um go well everybody and um keep fighting thanks everyone take care look after each other okay thanks everyone cheers bye, bye.